Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, The Changing American Consumer, the 2020 Census, and the Impact of the Hispanic Population Boom. I'm William Cimarosa, VP of Market Research for real-time market research tool, Suzy. We partner with hundreds of the world's top brands in helping them identify more agile ways to tap consumers for both qualitative and quantitative insights that drive business decisions. Today's discussion will focus on the 2020 census results and what they mean for research professionals and include a spotlight on the largest growing population according to the census, Hispanic households. Before we get started, let's get to know each other a little bit better. Um, Jake, let's start with you. Dr. Jake, let's start with you. Hi, Will. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Dr. Jake Benefla. I'm the, the executive director for the Center for Multicultural Science. Um, we are a multicultural marketing research think tank. I started this about 10 years ago to help clients drive uh, ROI and focus on questions that were uh, stumping corporate America. I also just published a book called The, um, the Big Shift, Redefining Marketing in a Multicultural America. Uh, about five years ago, I launched a, um, an academic journal called the Journal of Cultural Marketing Strategy, and I spent most of my career in the advertising and marketing business, um, primarily interested in multicultural segments. Thanks, Dr. Jake. Catherine, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what brings you uh, to this conversation today? Uh, Catherine, I think uh, we've lost your your uh, sound. What we'll do is we'll give you a moment to look at your microphone, and I'll I'll transfer over to Kim. Why don't you tell us um, a little bit about yourself and your background, and what brings us uh, together here today? Yeah. So, hello, everybody. My name is Kim Jones. I am a senior category development manager at Post Consumer Brands. Um, I have worked, currently work with um, all the national um, communications that go out of the company to our retailers. So I work really cross-functionally with um, brands, insights, analytics, graphics, sales, Catman, um, several different departments to make sure that the messages going out are appropriate and um, consumer friendly, retailer friendly. Um, and then I have a history also working with some larger CPGs like Coca-Cola and Red Bull. Thanks, Kim. Um Catherine, let's give it one more try. You ready? <laughs> let's see. You might want to adjust your uh, look uh, to see the microphone setting, and maybe you want to change where your microphone is coming from. And what we'll do is we'll give you a moment to, to troubleshoot that. Um, while, we're, um, while we're waiting for you to do that, we'll get started in the conversation, right? And a good place for us to start is the census. Um, I was hoping that each of you could tell me a little bit about what your experience has been with the census in the past. Um, and let's start with, with you, Dr. Jake. My experience with the census? Yeah, in the pa in, yeah, past experiences with the census and how you've leveraged it. Well, you know, it's fundamental to everything we're doing. Um, I mean, there's, pr there's primary, there's secondary research. But um, if you don't have access and if you're not using the, the census data as the backbone to what you're doing, I think you're, um, you know, you're, you're not in step with um, the changing demographics. So to me, I use the census as, as in the pew, for that matter. They're leveraging um, the census and, and their own work. But um, either, either the census and the pew to me are, are foundational to the work that we do in marketing. Um, thank you. <clears throat> Kim, how about you? Um, well, we do, obviously we take a look at um, census information, especially with the new one coming out, um, to make sure we understand how the demographics are changing and the markets are changing. I think with Hispanics, um, you especially need to understand where um, in the country you're looking and what what makeup that is, because definitely when you look at East Coast, that's you know more um, Cuban and Puerto Rican versus on the West Coast, it'll be more um, Mexico, Mexico, Central America, all down through there. So you really need to understand where they're where they're at and the different the differences between the different regions of the of the country. Uh, technical issues here. Can you guys hear me? Okay. So um, I, there we go. We'll just jump on. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. I don't know what is going on. Sorry about that. Um, let's just keep going. Hopefully, we'll get uh, Catherine back as well. 
So tell me a little bit about um, how this year's census has impacted what you guys need to do on a day to day basis. You know, what's interesting to me, Will, and, and you know, Kim, just jump in as well. Um, you know, people are making a lot of um, hoopla um, around the 2020 numbers, and there's you know, good reason for that. But at the same time, most of us have been looking at the ACS 2019 numbers, you know, and so what we're seeing, you know, year to year is exponential growth, growth across specifically multicultural. Um, we're seeing America, um, you know, getting older and grayer. Um, the trends of, of, of this country today and in the next 20 years and 100 years, and, you know, you can, you can just talk about the future, but the trends are, are, the, are the same. Um, the one interesting thing that I saw in the, in the census is in the last four years, which has never happened, we've seen at the national level, well, we've seen the non-Hispanic white population decline. So we've already seen the, the, the non-Hispanic white population, um, you know, have, have higher death rates than birth rates. And so that has to do with the changing demography. The older generation is now attributed to the whites. And, and the growth segments are Hispanic, are Asian, African-American, um, biracial. And more and more of these cities where brands have to win or lose, right? They win share, lose share at the local level, or you could argue the hyper local level is within these big multicultural cities like Los Angeles is 68%, sorry, 72% multicultural. New York is 68% multicultural. Chicago, where we're, we're all, you know, we, we were just at, uh, is 60% Hispanic and black. So, you know, you just can't, you can't think about the multicultural landscape or the multicultural consumers in a silo like we did 30 and 40 years ago. This is your new mainstream. The conversation about marketing um, is inherently multicultural. This is not somebody else's job. Um, and so the census keeps telling us the world is becoming more colorful. The whites are becoming less plentiful. Um, and that's, to me, well, changing the practice of marketing. It's changing the way we market. It doesn't change the principles of marketing, but it just changes well, the way that we think about marketing. Well, Kim, so as someone who, who's dealing with marketing activations on a day-to-day -day basis, when we, um, when we first met, you mentioned that your role is often like herding cats. How is this changing reality actually playing out in your day-to-day? -day? Uh, well, you know, the... The one thing that, you know, for example, um, as we release national sales materials, you know, we do them all in English. They're massive decks. That's a lot of work, a lot of information coming in. And we're compiling it to make, you know, really sure that it's, you know, digestible and repeatable out to our retailers. And the retailers then can understand how it's going to impact their consumers. One thing that we realized was missing was we do have a lot of retailers, especially down in like Texas, Southern California, Florida, that the, the retailers are, you know, their primary first language is Spanish and we are delivering these in English. So we said, okay, we have an opportunity here. So we started changing that. So we started taking our, our materials and condensing them down um, and converting them into Spanish language, which, you know, just again, kind of to like Jake saying on the local level, making it easier for them to understand, making it easier for them to, you know, review it. They can have the whole deck, but then they can go down and say, okay, I really do understand what we're trying to get across and what are the benefits of, you know, whatever brand. Um, I think that is really important to just think about how, what can you do in the work that you do um, to make sure you make it as easy as possible for whether it be the consumer or your customer to understand the message you're trying to get across. Um, another kind of piece of it that Jake made me think about, I come from a, a biracial family. So my husband's black, so we have mixed children. Um, and I think it's really interesting when I see, um, or not when I see, I should say, when he sees commercials on TV, he, you know, he doesn't pay attention. He just doesn't. Um, but when he sees them with especially mixed families or, you know, someone different than the typical, you know, white family on in the ad he notices it he calls it out he thinks you know he's like that's so cool i'm glad they're doing that um you know it looks like our family and i think that's really important across 
all the different races, right? People want to identify with it. And that's one way that, that companies can do that is to show that they understand and that they're talking to everyone, not just one, one segment or another. You know, Will, can I just jump in on, on this? Because I think this is a really important point. And I think what, what's interesting, like we've all been in marketing probably for more, more time than we want to sort of admit on, on screen here. But it's interesting how companies all of a sudden started addressing these nuances um, in their marketing because of the social um, social movement. Let's call it cultural. I, I want to call that a cultural renaissance. Like I think this is a, a birth, a moment of rebirth in our country from a cultural perspective. But what's beautiful about this is, and maybe there's a there's a flip side to this too. The nice thing about this is that companies started to listen to the customer, and so co companies that listen to the customer or, or are customer centric are always going to win. I mean, I think they're in better position or better position to win. But um, it takes. It took the it took the the country it took consumers to to tell everybody hey we we're here we exist and then all of a sudden companies said you know what we can't ignore and so like there it it just kind of changed the prism through which they saw the world and so I go back to the the point here that which is you know do the, do what the customer wants like be customer centric the biggest challenge in my in my experience is how do we change corporate mindset because the consumer is there. But the, sometimes the clients don't see that because they they have their own way of looking at the world. They have processes. That's not a bad thing. But these things have to keep evolving because, as we're talking about a multicultural America, you know, 20 years ago we didn't have before 2000. The census did not count, did not acknowledge, did not measure biracial people. They were there to begin with. They were there to begin with. But all of a sudden now we now you know, put a measure in place, right? Well, like as a, as a researcher, if you don't measure it, they don't, it, it doesn't exist. And so now we're seeing a lot more bi biracial, we see a biracial America. We see more Hispanics identifying as two or more races. We're seeing some of that as well across other segments, black. And so what that's, that's what's beautiful. We start to kind of question the way we look at the world through research. And, and, and I think you got to go back to the census because I think that's, they spend so much time working on the reliability and validity of, of their data. Yeah, so absolutely. The, the census is, is a great starting place to understand what the makeup of, of our population is. And, and it's a great starting point. Um, we've got Catherine back. I'd love to give her a chance to introduce herself. Um, and then let's, let's get a little bit of feedback from, from you, Catherine, on um, what the census has revealed for you um, in your role this year. Well, can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Welcome back. It's a brand, it is a brand new day. So uh, apologies. I really did have this figured out earlier. Um, so my name is Catherine Williams Brinkman. Um, I work at LinkedIn. I live in Oakland, California. Um, I also have a biracial family. My husband is white and um, we have two children. So um, Kim, I, I'm with you there. So um, I actually am here due to Dr. Jake and um, having him at LinkedIn on a, a panel or excuse me, a series that we do around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And since being at LinkedIn, really throughout all my career, but specifically at LinkedIn, have really started a grassroots um, movement, not a moment, a movement mm -hmm. um, in terms of putting DEI front and center. So top down, bottoms up within the organization that, that I sit within LinkedIn. Thank you. And has, has this uh, year's census um, impacted your day-to-day -day in that effort at all? Yes. Um, so we, we work with customers really around their hiring practices. Um, so looking at who they're hiring, how they're hiring, all of that. So when you see the census and what the census is now showing us um, and that not being necessarily representative of who's in their companies and who are, they are hiring, um, that has an effect on the changes that they want to make within their organizations. And they, they consult with us around how they can make those changes using LinkedIn as a platform. So we're hearing uh, the, make, the census has impacted you in terms of 
who your clients um, are targeting as for the makeup of the very company to be more reflective of reality. And, and Kim, we're hearing you that you need to make sure that the activations particularly are also reflective of who that population is, right? Which brings yeah. us back to why that census is so important. It really does help us take a poll or attendance really of, of who our, our audiences are. Um, Dr. Jake, could you tell me a little bit um, about some of the things that stood out to you this year, specifically in terms of uh, what marketers should be worrying about or concerned with when they look at the census? Yeah, you know, um, I think we have a tendency as marketers to look, the world is complex, it's complicated. Um, we have limited resources. We, we like to look at, um, it's easy to identify differences visually. And so there's a lot of uh, between group differences that we acknowledge. So we compare blacks to Hispanics, to whites, to Asians, and that's fine. Um, we don't do enough. Um, we don't discuss the within group differences enough. Defenses does that. Primary research does that. Um, certainly secondary research does that. But we ought to acknowledge the, the nuances. Like we have a biracial uh, two of our panelists live in biracial homes, but um, th they're inverted, right? And so black mom, white mom, and so those dynamics vary. Those dynamics are important, right? And so the household is run differently, right? So Kim brings a whole set of, um, you know, experiences from her mom to the household. Same thing like Catherine. Understanding those differences is really is really important for brands, and so just to say biracial doesn't mean the same biracial household, mm -hmm. right? When we look at Hispanic, for instance, we look we talk about the foreign born, U.S. born. We talk we ought to talk more about that, you know. So ninety one percent of according to the census, and I think this is still you know twenty nineteen data, but ninety one percent of the the U.S. born are English proficient. 91% of the foreign born are Spanish proficient, right? And so those differences in language use at home are very, have great implications on media usage. So we can't just say, like, we can't, we can no longer afford to, to talk um, on the average, right? Because the averages are just like, you have a one and you have a 10, and you have an average of a five and a half or six, very different number. Well, well, we need to acknowledge the differences when they use groups. And I think that's that's what I think we ought to. I think that's where the ROIs are, frankly. Yeah. A, a common tool to deal with differences and find commonalities, in, in, in fact, as well, especially when we need to manage a business, is uh, our segmentations. Um, could you tell me a little bit about how you've worked with segmentations, Dr. Jake, and, and what you might uh, think marketers should keep in mind, especially as this census comes out and we go into next year's uh, learning period? Yeah, I mean, so so I think I think it's fine that we begin this conversation at the group level, at the census level, yeah, sort of at the population level. But all the brands that I worked uh, worked on or worked with, Kim, I think you, you know you you've got the the CPG background. You can probably speak to this better too. You know, they're they're actually activating on a target audience. So if we talk about moms with kids. I bet you Catherine and Kim have a lot in common especially if their kids are 14 or teen, early teenagers. I have a 14, 15 year old too, right? So like as parents, we can, re we can relate to each other. If we're gonna, if we're looking for nutritional lunches or dinners or whatever, we probably have a lot in common. Anyway, the target audience, we, we go down to the segment, to the target, the people that are gonna drive the business. And so we gotta sort of do the work that takes us from the population sort of aggregated numbers to the, to the actual segment that drives the business. And there's a lot of work that gets to that. And the better, and the better companies have a process to get there and are sticky. They are not going to unravel when things get difficult, right? That's a good point. Can, can, does that match your experience? How are you guys dealing with um, the, the new makeup of the population when it comes to segmentation? And at your Yeah, company? so I can kind of actually go back a little bit further because I spent the first about 10 years of my career as a media buyer. So I was buying all different forms of media. Um, and I can remember some things where I had a Hispanic target um, for radio. And I had to buy that media very differently because the way they consume media is different. Um, so you have to think about it that way. Now you fast forward to, to now, um, 
in my previous role to the one I have now, I was a category manager and Puerto Rico was one of my assignments. So I was lucky enough to get to go to Puerto Rico every three months. And in that process, I, I learned a lot. You have to really understand like the dynamics, the culture, how they're consuming food, um, when they're consuming food, when are they buying the food, um, you know, health issues, uh, you know, all of those things. So, you know, a prime example of understanding it from a consumer package point of view, um, Malta Meal is one of our brands. And in, in the U.S., you see, you know, I don't know, between four to 12 feet of space and then everything else is box cereal. Whereas you flip it and you go down there, it's the opposite. It's 20 to 24 feet of bag cereal. And you're kind of like, wow, that's just really different. Well, what I've learned was that um, multiple bag cereal has a little a seal on the, on the bags. And that's really, really critical because with the humidity down there, um, they need that to keep the food fresh. Cause they, you know, food is expensive cause it's imported. So you want to make sure it tastes good. You want to make sure it lasts. So you have to think through like all of those things, you know, from the, how they're consuming it, what type they're consuming, the packaging and what impact it has in their home. Um, you know, really drilling down, like Jake's saying, like you have to target it, understand that when I was talking to my retailers down in Puerto Rico, it was a whole different conversation than when I was talking to um, Albertsons or H-E-B in the States. Um, so really understanding the dynamics and the difference between them and how how they look at marketing and products was was really, really important. Um, and with the census, you mean, you've got to stay up on that and you got to understand how it's evolving and changing. And like we said, it's 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 a melting pot and it's just becoming more and more of a melting pot. And with, with a diverse range of experiences, Catherine, how about on your end? Um, how are you guys dealing with this census coming out and particularly as it comes to grouping uh, differences or similarities uh, for your clients? Yeah, good question. So again, we're, we're in a, a period right now where people of color is something that that companies are actually looking to hire, right? That's, that hasn't always been the case. So- um, And it's not easy right now, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it hasn't always been the case. And I think at least this is what we're hearing is that it's also the way you approach people, right? And this is a huge generalization, but it's not necessarily HBCU, right? Like historically black college and universities is the target, right? I think that's easy and people think it's easy or to go after um, uh, companies where there are lots of Hispanics. Like that's, that's an easy target, but you're also leaving out an entire segment that may not have gone to, like myself, that didn't go to an HBCU. Um, that that's highly qualified. I will say, and um, before we we tell we we advise customers on like hiring and reaching pop different populations than they may be used to, you also have to figure out what's happening within your company, right? So you can hire as many. I'm just going to use the words black and brown people, right? And and again, this is these are huge generalizations. But if you have not, if you don't have a culture that is inclusive and you really examine that culture, people that you are hiring in the front door will leave out the back door or the side doors. So it, it's really in, you know, we think of the census and our, our, our customers think of the census of like, oh, we need to do more, but they also have to do some inward reflection on the company that you are welcoming or not welcoming people into. So that's a, that's a great point, right? We're talking, you're talking about culture, um, which is a, a key part of, of understanding where our population is as a culture. What does multicultural marketing really mean in this day and age for you, Catherine? Like what, what, what's involved in, in making sure like that you are addressing the different, like, like you said, there's not just one group of, of, of black or Hispanic or brown people, right? Like you need to understand the nuances and the similarities between them, right? How does that multicultural uh, element play out in your day-to-day -day right now in terms of how you actually make recommendations for your clients? Speaking, like th they need to listen and they need to understand that the majority is not the message that you necessarily need to go after. And how can you really speak to different people? And how can you hire different people and the 
the processes you have in place, it's not a one size fits all. And I think that's what we're talking a lot of like the way what got you here may not get you there if that's where you really truly want to be. And there has to be a lot of self-examination within these companies. And that's what we try and say, like, really, where are you on that journey of where you say you want to be? Because you can say a lot of things, but if you are at a culture that was established when the company was formed, then are you really going to allow for, for people that this, that this was really never built for? Right. Dr. Jake, what are you what are you seeing in terms of um, multicultural marketing these days? Like, what what does that really mean in, in twenty uh, with based on the twenty twenty census? You know, it's interesting. I, I I actually we should point out that corporate America is not homogeneous. And some of some of the work that I've sort of um, been kind of um, focused on looks at leaders, followers, and laggards, and and those and those leaders have different different um, different ways of looking at the world versus the ones that have less experience. And so um, those that are on the leading side, meaning maybe it's the one and twos of every category, those are the ones that I believe um, look at the, the, the consumer, their mainstream as multicultural. And so it's not like the siloed effort. It's not the secondary uh, uh, thoughts. Um, they're front and center. And they realize that you know, half of Los Angeles is, is Hispanic and most of them are from Mexico, at least Mexican descent, right? So like they've embraced it. Um, they have measures against it. They have, you know, ways of measuring as best as they can sales and they, you know, and they have, um, tracking studies on awareness and intent and purchase and all of that kind of stuff. And then there are companies that are still kind of lagging. So, um, there's a lot of work to be done, but I think the, the, the fact that this is a multicultural country becoming more and more multicultural and there's less whites that make up the mainstream is defining marketing in my view, as we know it. So Kim, I see you nodding your head, right? What are some of the biggest challenges you you face when building, you know, marketing campaigns or activations specifically for Hispanic households? So, you know, I I, I kind of grouping this not just current, but in just my my history. Um, two things: budget. It's always a thing, right? It's always not enough budget, but you need to have a budget. You need to have a strategic plan to target. If it's, if it's, you know, women 18 to 34, you know, you know, break down that demographic, you got to have that plan, but you have to have the budget to support that plan. Because if you don't have the budget to support it, you don't have the plan and you're not pulling the right levers, um, it's kind of all for nothing, right? You need to really think through gem pop is over here. And if you are going to do multicultural, Hispanic, whatever the case may be, it's over here. And just make sure you really think through, like, how are they shopping? How are they consuming media? How are, how are you going to get your message to them? I mean, if you have a, a brand that, you know, definitely speaks to that segment, um, you want and you want to grow share, that, you know, make sure you have a strong plan. I mean, they have, what, it's one in five. There's 90% of the current U.S. population is Hispanic. That means one in five members of the population are Hispanic. So if you think about that and the $1.7 trillion in spending power, if you need to grow share and you're in a heavily saturated market with Gen Pop, there's the way to go. But mm. you got to make sure you're you're communicating and hitting them in at strategic points of their, their day and how they consume their media. That's but there's, a, there's a fundamental truth there. If you want to win and grow as a brand, you need to be taking household, uh, or Hispanic households into account. That's, that's, that's where yeah. the, the size of prize is going to be. Yeah, um, they're leading the digital transformation. So you have to think about that and how you're going to market to them. And William, I think I think the if if you embrace that statement that you just said, we also need to acknowledge again who's like you know that Hispanic sixty five percent of the Hispanic population, and as, and, it, and when the twenty cents the twenty twenty numbers come out, it'll be closer to sixty eight sixty nine. But the overwhelming majority of Hispanics in the country are U.S. born. And for their English well, first. Well, that, that brings up nuances within um, the Hispanic and, community, right? So how, right. how do you recommend that, that brands handle those, nu those nuances? So, I mean, we've, we've traditionally allowed the, um, and that's fine. I mean, we've allowed the publishers to define this, this uh, marketing effort in language and culture. But I also want to ask a rhetorical question, like what does culture look like in a multicultural America? 
And so, like, you know, it's not just <laughs> the black and browns that are dealing with culture. Everybody is living in this cultural uh, country. And so let, let's like let's just kind of put culture in its proper place. Um, so we talk about culture, but it's it's kind of like the denominator that is underneath every every numerator that we talk about. At some point, it's just it is what it is, right? Um, and I think so. Understanding these nuances is is fundamental. And so where we were in the 1990s, where the Hispanic market, and again the census in the 1980s, 1990, all of all of those decennial uh, studies um, helped um, quantify the effort. But we defined Hispanic marketing by language, and we never really. And so once we um, developed, once mobile, social, digital, you have Gen Z, you have alphas, uh, you have you know millennials, you have a different world now. And you can't just kind of, you know, just put your your every dollar that you have in, in linear television because those ratings are dropping. Yeah. Even, even on sports, the ratings are dropping. And we know that everybody's streaming. Yeah. And so it's not, you know, ju it's you know not just the ratings. You, you'll see like on regular TV programs where there's no commercial spot. It's just a blank, you know, nothing to show here. It's, it's amazing how uh, other channels are beginning to, to take more precedence in terms of, of the day-to-day -day experiences um, throughout America. It, it really is a, a changing uh, environment, right? Um, yeah. and, and, you know, um, in terms of spend, if you think about spend as an indicator of, where, of what strategy is, right? It's a reflection of strategy. It's $50 billion in, in linear TV, almost $200 billion in digital. That's, that's the world we live in. And it's not language driven. I used to work for Me Too as a research director there. And we were targeting the bicultural, bilingual. We didn't develop content in language. There wasn't a brief that said English. This was a bicultural, bilingual individual, 18 and 34 female, right? Anyway, things, the, the world has changed. And I think, we need to, I think we have to encourage and we have to make sure that we remain agile and open to, to innovation and change. Well, you bring up an interesting point about language, right? Um, Kim and Catherine, how, how is language being, um, you know, addressed in your, on your end of the, of the business, right? Uh, I know, Kim, you mentioned that you've got to manage what language, you know, activations are going in. How are you guys addressing language now? Um, tell us a little bit about that process. Uh, so, like I said, in the, my, the previous role, I was converting stuff into Spanish to make it easier for some of our sales folks and our retailers um, to consume it and understand it. Um, I would say I am seeing more and more companies um, develop or create Hispanic teams that are specific, that that's their focus and that's it. So they are, they're, they're separate. Um, and I think that's a really smart thing. There's just so much opportunity out there um, that I think they need to be thinking about that. And, you know, creating a, a group that's, you know, subject matter experts that can guide this, the strategy and make sure they're going in the right direction. I think that is, you know, some companies are there and some are not. Um, but having people dedicated to that, as long as the, it makes sense for the brands, is really, really critical. So making sure that you have companies that um, are reflective of the population is going to be key to staying competitive today, especially as we look at how the, the demographics of this country are changing. Catherine, could you tell us a little bit about what DEI is um, and what some of the best practices you're seeing to make sure that companies are, are staffed and well-equipped to, to address the changing face of this country? Yeah, so DEI, it stands for diversity, equity, and inclusion, and really thinking about that in a holistic manner, right? Um, not just something like over there that we talk about, but really like the foundation. Um, so companies that are addressing it well, and I think Kim said this maybe in a different vein, but I think it goes along with it around like people have to have, companies have to have a plan. Like this isn't going to be solved without a plan, just like a business problem that everyone comes up with a plan for and you execute against the plan and the metrics that have been set. Those that are doing well actually have a plan in place. Right. And not just like a hope, a dream, a wish or, or a prayer. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, cross your fingers and hope things get better because we hire a couple people. Right. So 
first there's a plan. I think before you develop that plan, what we've seen with companies who are really doing this well is they listen and they're listening to the to the entire population. And Dr. Jake brought this up. It's not just those who may not have, you know, may not be in certain seats, but like, what is everyone looking for as a company evolves? Um, so they need to listen. <laughs> and um, finally, I mean, there are many things, but I'll, I'll stop with three, is accountability. Mm. If this does not happen in X amount of time, what happened? Like who is held to this, right? And not just like, well, it did happen, so we'll give it five more years, right? That's not typically what you do with, with a strong business plan. So it's mm -hmm. accountability that, and I'm not saying you have to take it to this level, but like who loses their job, who gets fired, who get, who shines if something does happen. Mm -hmm. And those who have these things and other things in place are really, as, as Dr. Jake uses, and he spoke to this when he spoke at LinkedIn around like are leading and they're not lagging or, or following. Well, you're speak I hear you speaking a lot about planning your work and then working your plan, right? And a key component of that are metrics and KPIs. You mentioned that briefly. What are some uh, DEI metrics that companies are using and which ones do you recommend? Yeah, well, I mean, if I if I knew all the answers, it'd be great, but I'll, <laughs> I'll start with, with some that people are using. So, um, Number of hires is something, right? Number of hires in certain groups um, or, or all groups, really. How are you, how are you, how are we measuring that? Um, stated goals of like, here's what we want to be in a time to get there. I think those who do it even better are their goals in between, right? There's not just an end goal, but what are the goals leading up to that? Um, Something that like we do at LinkedIn that I think has worked is surveys. How's it going? Like, um, not just in five years, we'll ask you that, but like measurement um, during like critical times or just measurement on a regular basis. Um, um, yeah, you, need a, you need a feedback loop to, to see how exactly, you're doing. Exactly. Yeah. So, so those are some of the things that, that we're seeing. Yeah. You know, I was going to just, just um, kind of um, jump on some of the points that Catherine was making. I think um, measuring those that enter the company is 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 an easy measure, uh, and it's a it's a safe measure, um, and it's it's a make me feel good measure because you you see you know it's like hey we're we're bringing them in. The biggest challenge in my view, and Catherine, you can maybe speak to this in general, but it's the retention piece. One hundred percent. It's one hundred percent. It's a cultural. It's a like if you're not changing the culture, and this is the problem that I that that we that I as a white man never thought about, right? I never thought about uh, the culture until the culture the cultural fit wasn't for me, right? And so the more I heard things that I never knew in the last two years, it was like it was astonishing. So just the little things like. You, you, what do you mean you can't be yourself? What do you mean you have to do your hair? Like all of those little things that I never even knew were so important. The fact that, you know, people spoke over me. I had some of that. I had, I've been disrespected in corporate America, but I always felt like that's the, that's one guy I don't want to work with. But when it becomes a systemic thing or there's a cultural thing and you're the only one in the room that, that you know, I, I, in one of my earlier meetings in, in my career, I was probably 26, and one of the clients, as we were waiting for the status meeting to start, a huge room with Joe Market, Hispanic, Asian agencies, clients. One client goes, Jake, talk to us in Spanish. Tell us, tell us something in Spanish, right? And I was too young to, to, to even understand what was going on. But 20 years later, 30 years later, you go back and you're like, hey, that's, that's just not right. I didn't make me feel comfortable, but I didn't, it was too young for me to understand what, what was going on. So changing the culture of companies is not easy. And, it, and, it's, and, it's a, and, and those are values-driven things that you know who holds those are the senior leaders, not the middle management, not the entry-level people. It's the people at the top that are reporting to the investors, 
that obviously have some very big stakes in the game. And so, so it's so like profound. The work that we do is so meaningful, but if you can't keep them in, you know, it's a revolving door. And so Catherine, you got my support because that work you do is so important and so tough. Um, and accountability, like you said, is really like nobody wants it because, you know, like it's, it's like, it's to churn. It's like those wireless companies, you know, you bring in a million, but you lose two, <laughs> you know, and yeah, now and everybody if has we to go back. Attention. If we go back to your rhetorical question about culture, like what culture is and what is a multicultural yeah. culture, right? The reality is if you don't have a company that understands and experiences the values of your consumers, it's going to be hard to successfully execute and be relevant to them, right? There, it, it is, is connected. And it's, it is impossible to really know, to, uh, to know what, what you don't know, right? As a white man, you'll never be able to have those experiences, right? Experience really is the key here, you know, to understanding. Um, there's a saying that you would never be able to understand what a deep thinker is without experiencing physical depth. As a white man, you'll never experience the things that other races and colors have experienced. You'll never be able to actually know it. But the reality is you have a majority of the population that are having those experiences. And if you can't bring those experiences into your company, you're never going to be able to align with the values of your consumer, right? You have to accept the fact that you're not going to be able to understand some of these experiences. Your company will only be stronger if you can diversify those experiences because you can only then be relevant, right? Um, Kim, yeah. how are you guys handling staying relevant um, as things change in terms of activations and, and, and how your teams deal with some of the unknowns of, of, of the nuances of culture? Well, we've worked with Dr. Jake. We've had him come in and speak. He's fantastic. So right. highly recommend, um, you know, he was super helpful um, to just think a little bit differently. Um, you know, we're, we always are looking at doing things differently. Um, you know, not so much like have a plan. If it doesn't work, learn from the, what didn't work and then, you know, adjust it. Right. So being quick, Getting, getting, getting it out there, seeing what works, what doesn't work, and then adjusting. So I think that's the critical thing that people need to remember. Like, not everything's going to work. Mm -hmm. It's just not. We know that. Um, does it always mean someone needs to lose their job? No, but it needs to learn from it and don't repeat it. Um, kind of like the accountability, you know, stand up. Yep, it didn't work. But this is what I learned and this is what I recommend. So I think that's, the, you, know, it, you know, talking about kind of culture, like developing that culture where it's safe to stay. Yeah, that didn't work or um, oops, mistake, we shouldn't have done this. Um, and then come up and have a plan ready to go. I think that's really important across it, any, any business that you're doing, right? You need to be accountable for it. Um, and it needs to be okay to say that it's not okay. Hmm. Catherine, could you talk a little bit about some of the accountability, uh, actions that you're seeing? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think, Kim has, has, has said a few of them, right? Like it, it's having that plan. I think it's also, and again, I, I shouldn't, I don't need to repeat her. So I think she said a lot of it. Um, if it doesn't work, state that it didn't work, why it didn't work. And, 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 and let's move on to plan B or plan two, whatever that is. Right. And so it's when it just falls short and we don't talk about it. And it didn't work and we don't know why. I think that's where where you lose people. Um, and I just want to make one point that Dr. Jake made that was spot on about retention. It's retention and it's promoting people, right? Because people leave because they don't, well, people leave for many reasons. One reason being the culture, and these could be multiple reasons, and or they don't see a path for them there. Right. And so it, it's multifaceted, really, of like hire people and promote them within the organization. A risky hire, right? People say risky hires. I don't think of people as risky. It can be you need you may need to work with them and coach them and develop people, mm -hmm. but but people in and of themselves um aren't unless we're talking about something else, they're they're usually not risky. You're, you're, you're spot on. You know, well, I just want to add to, to, to this conversation because, um, you know, I've worked with some real, I've just talked about the leading organizations they are the toughest ones to change because they have a very structured process that they believe works. And it probably works because they're, you know, like Procter & Gamble has something like 
more than a more like a, more than a dozen brands that generate a billion dollars in revenue a year. So they've got a system that works for them. Changing these systems is 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 um, is not something that uh, a lot of people are willing to do. I'll give you an example. As a, as a, if I if I were a, um, a general manager of a CPG division, I want to recruit the, the smartest and the best people in this country. My pathways are like Ivy schools, Stanford, uh, MIT, Wharton, especially the MBAs, right? Because I have a set of criteria that I want in these smart people. Now you start looking at those schools. And all of a sudden, I don't see people like Catherine. You don't see people like me. Maybe you see Kim. Maybe you don't. <laughs> so then you start, start asking yourself, well, am I, am I get? oh, maybe I can bring Howard in. Okay. Because that's considered an Ivy school. But what about, I didn't go to Ivy schools. I have a PhD, but it took me, I went to Golden Gate University. You probably didn't even hear me. You didn't even know me. And here I am you know, making some ripples here and there, Catherine, all of us didn't go to Ivy schools, I think. So, so what about those that are not in those paths, in those schools that you're normally recruiting? You have to fundamentally look at things very differently if you want different people, or you build a system so that you bring in people that you can now incul in inculcate your values, your systems, right? And so there's a lot of different ways. There's a lot of homework that has to get done. Well, and so it's not easy, but I'm just telling you that we just can't continue to do what we were doing, you know, in the 20th century moving forward. That's for sure. Yeah. Well, well systems are, are, are typically used to describe something that's absence of people. Right. And we're actually talking about culture and, and which has people at the heart of it. Right. When someone blames the system, right. They, yeah. they're, they're actually right in that there is no actual person there. It's some, we're doing these things for that just to serve itself, its own processes, right. Because systems are self-serving. Um, when you look at systems, you don't see the end result or the purpose of it. You just see cogs in the machine, right. Ultimately, if we're going to stay relevant, we need to have people back into the picture, right. And we need to make sure that the values of the organization that are producing the products that we sell, the brands that we represent um, are relevant to the people there. So, I think it's that's a great point is taking another look at the system itself and understanding where can we inject the values and the human experiences that are going to keep us competitive. With that in you, mind, are there anything else that you think is is down the pipeline beyond just Hispanic households for the future of multicultural marketing with, you know, within the context of these systems um, and where we're going as a, as, a, as a culture? I would say just, you know, keep in mind that many U.S. Hispanics are really immersed in both American and Latino culture. Mm -hmm. um, they're largely bilingual and bicultural. So keep that in mind, right? They're doing a little bit of both. So how do you make sure you're getting the right message to the right demographic at the right time and the right avenue? Um, think through that and how to, how to do that. Catherine, I see you uh, nodding your head. What, do you, what, do you, uh, what are your thoughts on, on the future of, of multicultural marketing? You know, I'm looking from, you know, the, the, my lens is from uh, the the um, the higher being your consumer, right? And 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 for and in what what I do at LinkedIn, and it's um, really taking into a like into consideration the richness of people and not being like a one size fits all and having this this these cultures and this richness what i consider richness is helps an organization mm -hmm. doesn't hinder or hurt an organization but work has to be done in order for this to be a successful plan and Actually, we'll, let's it, take oh. oh sorry go ahead I thought, that, I thought that question was for the three of us. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry. Yes. No, no, I'm just sorry. <laughs> Josh, Jake, I didn't mean to exclude you. <laughs> no, I'm just, listen, go for it. Go for it. Go ahead. No, no, no please. Um, I, I would like to, to hear your thoughts. You know, I, I, I mean, we're, we're moving in this. We're, we're in the world of big data. We're, we're going to swim in big data. And so big data is not, um, you know, not going to disappear all of a sudden. My worry is that we're going to be making decisions that don't reflect the consumer and don't capture the richness 
of of these of us of, of the consumer that that we and, and address the differences because big data and machine learning and all of these things are are going to capture our patterns and and um you know i don't even know i don't even need to know who you are or your name or your gender i just know what your pathway is and what your outcome is so we we're going to get into this into this new world that um may um may convolute this conversation a little bit but i think i'm hoping that um, there will be a balance between the machine learning, um, data science aspects of marketing, and then the, the, the traditional research of qual and quant, and and looking at the combination of all the all these tools. Well, that that brings us um, to a, a, a transition point where we could actually start to talk about some questions from the audience. Are you guys able to see some of the questions that have been published? I'm gonna I'll read them out loud, and we'll start with with the first one that I see here. Right, and this is from uh, Carlos H. Uh, what have you seen work well for addressing two seemingly conflicting needs for successful digital marketing? One, the need to be sensitive to DEI and other cultural nuances. And two, the need to move quickly as things change and evolve. Those are conflicting needs, right? Move, understand what's going on and, and uh, be sensitive, but also move fast. Um, Kim, how have you dealt with the need to move fast in a multicultural world? Um, constantly, constantly sharing information. So whether it be with the brand team, with our, the sales team, with the customer, um, always updating them, always giving them the latest and greatest information. Um, being a thought leader um, is really, really important. And if you're working in markets or areas where they may not have access to the data or the insights, um, bring it to them. And that, you know, that's a huge, huge thing. I had some, I mean, I developed a fantastic relationship with Walmart in Puerto Rico because I was the only one bringing it to them. Mm. And so um, even with some language barriers, they finally said, okay, forget the sales guy who <laughs> could speak Spanish. And they brought me in and we got through it. And, and, you know, I would share this information, like, this is what we need. This is we're lacking. So how can you help people and, and get them the most up-to-date information um, and to help them move forward and, and think of through their business? It, well, you know, the, the other thing is here that there's there's a difference between noise and a signal. And I think companies have to just weed out the, the, the noise. And so as you're trying to just like, just not even stop, you're like in, you know, fifth gear every single day as a brand, there's just too much noise around this, you know, consumer. Everyone has a perspective. Everybody has a political angle. Everybody has a business angle. But as a brand, you got to say, I only listen to these signals. That's what I trust. And so everything is noise. Sorry for telling you that. But, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to just kind of because you're moving so fast. And the Dr. World Jake, you sound like my day to day, right? So like what I would what I've seen work most successfully based on Carlos uh, question, and it's not just for, for DEI and multicultural, but when you're not sure what message is going to be the appropriate one, it's taking the time first when you know you have to move quick, spend the time to understand what what are the messages and experiences that actually matter. Mm -hmm. Matter usually means behavior change or relevancy, right? What are the things that are going to be the key to connecting with that consumer and then focusing, right? You can be very focused um, and move quickly if you have narrowed down the things that you need to say and do. Um, and even then, if you're not sure, I recommend you hedge. What are all the ways that you can say um, those things that are relevant and see and learn in real, real time how they're performing? One yeah. is performing better than the other, pull it. Right, invest more in the other one. Right, these are the this is the way that you can stay agile in, in this day. Yeah. But, but really understanding what are the levers that you can pull and focusing on them that'll help you move with well, greater speed. And I would add to that. I absolutely agree. But I would also add making sure it's not getting lost in translation. If you're doing something where there's translation, because we've all seen things, whatever an ad, and we're like, wait, what did they just say? <laughs> and especially when you're talking about language. Um, really test that out and make sure because I, I remember examples from back years ago um, that I've heard. I'm not going to repeat them because I don't want to offend anybody, but um, it just was a big like, oops, somebody didn't didn't think this through all the way. Um, so yeah, translation and interpretation are two different things, right? What is yep, the meaning yep, in the context? Yep, exactly. I also think that it helps if those who are evaluating certain things, like it's not one type of person in the room, right? Like you have different perspectives. Like, mm -hmm. so like Kim, as you just said, I've seen some of these commercials, right? There was some commercial where the person was like, 
black and then got clean and became white or like there was something like, like <laughs> who who thought this was a good idea right like <laughs> and and i think if you have if you have um more people in the room more perspectives mm -hmm. then you don't necessarily make i'm not saying you don't make any mistakes because we don't live in that world but you you have more perspectives before um it hits a, a wider group yeah I've, I've got another question here that's interesting um, from Victoria M. And it's a, it's a little bit longer, but I'll, I'll get through this here. I read, somewhere that, I read somewhere that younger respondents are the least likely age group to provide an answer when asked to describe their race or ethnicity, even when a write-in answer option is included. Knowing a younger generation, uh, generations are becoming more and more multicultural, what are the implications of an increase in the number of people who choose not to identify their ethnicity or race? Any guidance on how we should be interpreting the respondents who select prefer not to answer for race and ethnicity questions? This is great. Like we, we're talking about the importance of having a feedback loop. How do you address when people don't um, provide or volunteer that information? You know, I think I think there is a, a significant rise in the other population group um, that we that we have not talked about. I think it's a it's a methodological issue, but this is sort of what happens when you when you um, have a different, you know, you know, a multicultural population and you have biracial and you have all of these other, uh, and you have new generations that interpret um, these things differently. Um, I don't know what to do about it, to be honest, because I think um, we're used to looking at the boxes. This is what I was saying about. So, you know, black and Hispanic and white, we know those differences, Asians are different, you know, but what do we do with this? This is the kind of stuff that, you know, um, someone has to figure out or we have to start thinking about and kind of um, digging into it. I don't have an answer for you, but I think there's something that we've got to think about because it's uh, it's on the rise and it's not going to just go away. One thing that I would also remind uh, from a research perspective is that you never ask a question about something that you can observe, right? So one thing that I would suggest in dealing with the, the that, you know, declining to identify is the ability to look at other data points that could help you identify, just so that you have an idea of what is the makeup of your population, right? Um, of course, self-identifying is always the, is the is going to be the easiest and straightest path, but I do challenge marketers and researchers to look at other ways to identify a, a race so they can keep a better tab on who your users are. Hey, Will, there's a last question from Shaili. Shaili? Yeah. Any uh, stories or examples of how companies can address the differences across cultures without resorting to stereotypes? That's a good one for us to close on in our last couple of minutes. Um, that is always the risk, right? Is 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 falling back on stereotypes? Well, I mean, you fall you fall on stereotypes because you don't have any research, right? So you're 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 you or experience or experience, but I mean, conceptualizing the world, you know, based on your and so my my suggestion is, you know, where's the research? Um, so fight the stereotypes. Um, they, they simplify the complex for sure. Um, there's a grain of truth in them, but they're probably not accurate. But at the, at the end of the day, I mean, Kim, you know, you're, you're, you're building, you're driving revenue through, through marketing, uh, through a brand, you know, like everything you do should be grounded on the consumer and that consumer is based on the research that you've conducted. Nothing about your consumer on the output side, on the communication side, or on the consumption side, or the shopping side, innovation side is based on stereotypes. It's all yeah. based on research. That's that's the piece. Insights that I would... and analytics. That's what it's about. And if you don't have that insight to drive it, you got a question if you should even be doing it. That's right. Music to my ears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Call William. <laughs> well, guys, it's it's just about 2 p.m. I wanted to thank everyone for your participation. This has been a, a, a very um, insightful conversation for myself. Um, I really do appreciate all the time that you guys took to be here with us today. Um, uh, and I hope you guys have a, a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank